Good evening and welcome to Rahel Baptist Church for Wednesday evening, December 20th, 2020. This evening's message brought to us by Brother Steve Stewart is entitled, In the Midst of the Storm. Good to see you tonight. I want you to take your Bibles and I uh, trust that you brought them tonight. Uh, the scripture will be on the board, but uh, if you have your Bible... Turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4, it's where the Lord's led me tonight, Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 35 through 41 at the outset, and then we will talk about uh, this passage tonight. Verse number 35 says, on the same day when Jesus had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude... They took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the word of God. We thank, we thank you so much for what it tells us and what it does for us and how it encourages and how it helps us as we go through our life's journey. And Lord, as we look into this message tonight, I pray it will be encouraging. And I pray, Lord, that it will also be a reminder of who you are and your power and your presence and all of your promises. So God be with us as we go through the next few minutes together in this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Speaking on this subject tonight, in the midst of the storm... And I'm going to go ahead and ask Carl to put up the, the outline if you are writing things down. I came up with three things in this passage. First of all, great dangers. Secondly, great doubts. And third, great discoveries. Now, the last time I spoke to you, uh, it's been several weeks ago, I encouraged you, or hope I encouraged you, with a message uh, that said this, fret not. You remember that? Those of you who were here in Psalm 37. How many of you stopped worrying since then? Okay, nobody raised their hand, Brother Mike. Well, tonight I want to encourage you to fear not. To fear not. And I know that that is a human emotion, so to speak, and it's hard not to uh, when we, uh, we see so many things coming into our life's journey. But uh, I want to encourage you to fear not. Now, fear can overtake us. And for a lot of people... They have experienced just that. And, and I'm basically referring to this past year, uh, 2020. We've seen the evidence of how fear can overwhelm uh, not only our country, but uh, people uh, across the world. Uh, 2020, for me at least, began with uh, goals being set and programs planned, strategies set in motion, new things, fresh ideas. All of those things as we began a new year, and then the storm of a virus hit. And in just what seemed like a matter of moments, it shut down the world. But here's a sad thing that I thought of, or the Lord put on my heart. Maybe even for some Christians, it's affected their faith. 2020 and this virus and the fear that they have. And folks, I promise you, if, if you live a fearful life, it will affect your faith in a negative way. And so I just want to encourage you tonight, again, as I said, to fear not. And I think that's why the Lord sent me to Mark chapter 4. When you begin Mark chapter 4, you see Jesus sitting in a boat and he's teaching. He goes through and he teaches about uh, uh, the parable of the sower and he teaches the purposes of parables and he tells us to, uh, to uh, or he talks about the parable of the mustard seed and then he ends this particular chapter, chapter 4, asleep in a boat. Now, 
I want us to see those three things uh, tonight. First of all, great dangers. Again, in verse 35, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. I want you to notice, first of all, the suddenness of this storm. Now, 2020 came in a few months later. We all of a sudden we had this virus that hit. All of a sudden, life is just completely changing. Momentum is completely changing. It suddenly came upon us. But in this particular story, I see that this storm suddenly came upon them. Now, if you know the geography of, of this uh, body of water, the Sea of Galilee, you'll note that it is a small body of water, relatively speaking. It's really only 13 miles long and 7 miles wide, and the water at its uh, zenith is 150 foot deep. But here's the trick to it. The shoreline is 680 feet below sea level. And it's also surrounded by mountains, and I've seen pictures of it, and I can see how, uh, how all of a sudden the wind could just uh, come gushing in and, and, and suddenly uh, raise up a storm. And that's exactly what happened. But I want you to notice something here. Uh, because of its location, these storms can suddenly come up. But what about life? That's kind of like life, isn't it? Things can be fine one moment, and then the next, it seems like the bottom falls out. All of a sudden, things begin. And I want to tell you, that, that saying, and I don't know who put it out there, you're either in a storm, or you're coming out of the storm, or you're going to be in another storm. That is certainly true. I think that that's just part of life. As, and uh, here's, here's the thing. You do not have to be fearful if Jesus is in your boat. Okay? Get that in your mind tonight. You do not have to be fearful if he's in the boat. So the suddenness of the storm, but not only that, I see the severity of the storm. It tells us here that uh, the ship uh, was filling up there in verse 37, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling up. Now, I find the, the Holy Spirit, I love how he writes and how he has written the word. Because he says here, a great windstorm arose. He could have just said a windstorm arose. He could have said a little breeze blew up. But he says a great windstorm arose. And for Peter, James, John, and Andrew, these seasoned fishermen, perhaps this may have been one of the worst storms that they had ever encountered as they were in this ship. And this ship is not a very big ship, okay? Now, I've not seen some of the models that are around. And as you go to the Holy Land, they say you can see one and, and the model of it. But I, but I understand that the decks are pretty short decks because they have to throw their nets out and draw them back in. So these are not really, really big ships. But there, in one of the places in that ship, Jesus was there and He was asleep. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But to them, to the seasoned fishermen, this storm seemed different. It was more violent, perhaps, than they had ever encountered. So they were in terrible danger. And here's the thing. They feared for their life. Again, isn't that a lot like we face in life? Storms are often severe and cause us great anguish and pain. Sometimes it seems like our boat is filling up with water. And you know what? When it starts filling up with water, what does it usually start doing? It starts to sink, doesn't it? And so we've got to understand that these storms can be severe, and many times they are severe within our lives, just as it was to the disciples there. But not only the severity of the storm and the suddenness, but how about the source of the storm? And I want you to think about something. Rough weather should never surprise us. Now you hear the old cliche, you live in Arkansas, just if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes. You know, it'll change. You know, Arkansas has some rough weather. I never will forget, uh, when I was 13, I went to deep sea fishing. Anybody ever done that? You know, a 13-year-old should never go deep sea fishing. 
because I had no clue what it was about. You know, and you're going up like this, and I spent my time sick instead of fishing. And uh, I can imagine uh, what they were feeling like on this particular boat that particular evening. But I want you to, I want you to note something that, that I found in the Word. And you have heard this before. Listen to this. Storms must come our way if we want to live a godly life. You say, well, how can that be, preacher? Well, let me, let me give you a scripture on that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says this. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You get that? If you desire to live godly, you're going to suffer persecution. But the question is, where did the storm come from? Was it natural? Did God send it? Was it satanic in origin? And as I was reading this and looking at commentary, everybody had a different opinion concerning uh, this particular passage. But all I know is this. Jesus was aware that the storm was going to happen. It didn't take him by surprise. And he still went to the stern of the ship and went to sleep. I want you to think about that. But sometimes storms do come in our life from various sources. Number one, sometimes storms are our own fault. Now think about Jonah for a minute. You remember Jonah? God says, I want you to go. What did Jonah say? No. God said to Jonah, then woe. He sent that well, didn't he? That, that giant fish. Jonah went on that little three-day ride. Three-day, three-night ride. And all of a sudden, Jonah said, oh, I'll go, I'll go. God had a way of getting into his prophet's life, even though it took the storm of that fish to get him where he needed to go. But his disobedience, I believe, brought about his trouble that day. But sometimes God sends the storms. Sometimes God does this to discipline us. Sometimes God does it to draw us closer to him. How many of you really, really want to get closer to him every day? Isn't that your desire? It should be your desire. And sometimes He sends storms to teach us to trust Him more. Now, there's a passage in Hebrews that I want, to, want us to turn to and read. I just love this passage. Now, it's not easy when you're thinking about chastisement and you're thinking about the Lord having to chasten His children and all that. But if you'll notice in verse 10 and 11, I find some interesting words. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but He... He being capitalized, speaking of deity, for our own, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Do you see that? He disciplines us so that we can become partakers of his holiness. Now, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Well, my dad taught me that. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So there's sometimes that God brings storms into our life in order to bring us closer, in order to teach us to trust Him. But then there are times that I believe Satan will whip up a storm. You remember Job, for example. Satan goes to God and says, oh, he just does what he does because you bless him so much. And he said, if you'll just take all this away, he'll curse you and, and he'll die. And God said, you could do anything you want to him, just don't take his life. And so the devil just whipped up a storm, one storm after another in the life of Job. And um, I think the thing we need to take from that is this, that we have a real enemy out there. And he is going to and fro and using his demonic armies to tempt and to try to destroy each and every Christian that's here on the face of this earth. But it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that is his mission, I believe, his main mission is to kill, to steal, and to destroy you as a Christian. So there's great danger out there. Disciples found themselves in the midst of that. But I want you to notice, secondly, there are great doubts. They had great doubts. Now look in verse 38. 
But he, being Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. I just love that. In the midst of the storm, he's at peace. In the midst of the storm, he's at rest. you got to remember, he had just taught all day long. And the human side of him was tired. He got tired just like you and I get tired. And he was wore out. And so he was just sleeping through this. And I found this very interesting that when you look at it, at it in its context, they awoke him. That word awoke kind of comes across as a violent shake. They went to him and began to violently shake him to wake him up. Now, I could just see Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and whoever else was on the boat, they're all gathering down there around Jesus, and they're saying, oh, he's asleep. Well, we're going to have to wake him up because he doesn't care about us anymore. And see, that to me uh, was one of their doubts. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment. It was Their doubts was manifested in the way they awoke Jesus. It was telling us that they were scared to death. Now, I've heard some statements. Now, I've heard a lot more than these three statements I want to give you in my 40, 40 plus years of ministry. But the sad thing about it is these are statements that I have heard from Christian people. And in my opinion, all of these statements just bleed doubts. Now here's the first one. I've always been a good Christian. Why is God letting this happen to me? You ever heard that? The second one is, where's God when I need Him? Do you see, do you see the doubt that's involved in that? Or the third one is this, how can God let such terrible things happen in this world? Well, when we come to these disciples, they doubted, first of all, His concern for them. They doubted His concern for them. Notice what it says. They said, Teacher, do you not care? Teacher, do you not care? They were doubting his, the fact that He even cared for them. They accused the Lord of not caring. I hope you've never done that. Because I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what you do, what you've been through, what you're going through, Jesus will always care about you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Can I say it one more time? Jesus cares for you. He cares for you. He cares about you. Now secondly, not only did they doubt His concern for them, he, they doubted His commitment to them. Notice as they go on here in verse 38, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Hey, Jesus is imminent. We're going to die if you don't do something about this. So they, they doubted His commitment by the way, wasn't it Jesus who had sent them out there in the first place? He knew the storm was coming. Now, we know that other story where He walked on the water. That's a different, different time, but uh, Jesus sent them out then as well. So He knows exactly what those disciples needed, and He knows exactly what we need. But let me remind you of this verse, Hebrews 13, 5, and the last part of it. Uh, he will never leave us. Or He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now I found it interesting as I was uh, looking at those words, the word leave means to let sink. Let that sink in for a minute. To let sink. And the word forsake means that He won't abandon you. In other words, Jesus said in that verse in Hebrews, I'm not going to let you sink in life and I'm never going to abandon you. Now if your boat's filling up, there's your promise right there. He's not going to let you sink. He just said that, did He not? I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, nor will I abandon you, desert you, or leave you under any circumstances. And I find that the disciples, they, they learned that lesson. Now hear this. Jesus is absolutely committed to you. Personally, He is committed to you. But not only did they doubt His concern and His commitment, but they doubted His comments. Now look again in verse 35. He said, On the same day when evening had come, He said to them, now here's the red letters, let us cross over to the other side. Us included everyone in the boat, okay? Let us cross 
to the other side. Jesus had a destination he was going to. He had already commented on that, but they doubted his comment. But God had already promised that everything was going to be all right. What does it say in Romans 8, 28? Y'all know that verse. And we know that all things work together. Right? For good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 15. says, for all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory." Hope, Folks, those are comments from the Lord. Those are comments that we need to hear. We do not need to doubt those comments. So we see great dangers and we see great doubt. But I want to end on an encouraging note tonight. We see great discoveries. In verse 39, it says, Then He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, any of y'all ever thrown a rock out into the water and you just see it ripple? It takes it a little while for that to calm down. But I believe that immediately when he said, peace be still, that particular sea was just like a sea of glass. It just calmed down. What did they discover? Well, several things, and I'm going to give you a few of those tonight, but... The first thing I believe they discovered was the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The power. How many of us need to be reminded of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ? I think we see that from time to time in our own life. And when we go through the storm like we've gone through in 2020, and we don't know what 2021 is going to bring, that storm may continue all through the year. We don't know. And it may be a different storm, but we know this, we will be able to see the execution of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Oh, listen, folks. He is able to go above and beyond all that we ask. In other words... If you're writing stuff down, write this down. Your storm is no problem for Jesus. Your storm is no problem for Jesus. Now, not only did they discover the power of the Lord, but they discovered the promises of the Lord. Now, it says in chapter 5, verse 1, then they came to the other side of the sea. That's what Jesus said. They were going to go to the other side, to the country of the Gadatarines. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, what can you take out of, uh, out of a verse like that? What can, we, what can we glean from that? Well, I believe you can glean this. God is still good at His Word. God still keeps His promises. Now, think about it. He told the disciples in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled, right? If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Folks, that is a promise from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is still good at His Word. Now, if we continue through a storm the rest of our life, just realize what's on the other side. He's got us in a boat called life right now, and He said we're going to the other side. Folks, the other side is heaven. We've got that to look forward to. But not only did they discover the promises of the Lord, but they discovered the presence of the Lord. Look again in verse 38. Where was Jesus? He was asleep on the pillow. 
Now, the thing about that is he was in their boat. His very presence, his very body, his very life was there physically in their boat. Now, I love what Psalm 16 verse 11 says. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And here's the thing. Having Jesus in your boat will make all the difference. Now you got to remember there were other boats that were out there too and they were going through the storm. They didn't have Jesus in their boat. Can you imagine the fear and the turmoil that they were going through? It doesn't tell us and indicate to us what was going on in those boats, but you can imagine. It's just kind of a metaphor of what people are going through in life, going through the storms of life that do not have Jesus in their heart and in their life. In my chaplaincy over the past 23 years, I have dealt with more families. About 95% of the families I have dealt with did not have a church home or a, church or, or a pastor. And y'all, are gonna, y'all probably won't believe this, but I have preached over 1,000 sermons in over 23 years to people that don't go to church or don't have a pastor. You think I shared the Gospel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they need to hear that Jesus needs to be in their boat. How about the presence of Jesus in your life? Has He made a difference? I think He has. Let me give you a couple more and then I'm done. They discovered the purposes of the Lord. Now when they got over to the other side, Jesus went to work. We find that He uh, healed a demon-possessed man. He restored a girl back to life. He healed a woman who had a long-term illness. Now why did He go about and do that? Now, he knew he was going to do it in the first place, but why did he want the disciples there to see it? Well, I think the main reason was to strengthen their faith. Because through the storm, their faith was being affected in a negative way. Now, Jesus wanted their faith to be affected in a positive way and in a way that would make a difference in their life. And here's the kicker. His purpose is not to hurt us. His purpose is to grow us. And that's what I see as we go through uh, that particular story there. But two more, they discovered the peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord. In verse 39, then he arose and rebuked the wind. Now the word rebuked is a very interesting word. And when you go back and you look at, at this, and in antiquity you find that many of the storms they believe were caused by demonic power. And so Jesus used a, the Holy Spirit used a powerful word as he used the word rebuke. He stood up and rebuked the storm. And really that word means to muzzle a fierce beast. I'm going to tell you, there's no one more fierce than the devil. But guess, y'all know this, God can muzzle the devil, don't you know that? (laughs) And here's the thing, if a situation doesn't rattle the Lord, we shouldn't let it rattle us. Right? So don't let the storms of life rattle you. And then the last one is this. They discovered the person of the Lord. Oh, they, it just seems like something fell off their eyes and they, they really saw the Lord. And you know what? Through the storm that we've been going through, folks, I, I have been looking more for and looking to and trying to learn more about the person of the Lord Jesus than ever before. And here's what they said. They said, who can this be? What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey Him? Folks, God can corral the waves. He can lasso the winds. And He can hogtie any storm because of who He is. I'm going to tell you, you'll never know a greater person than Jesus. That is a fact. I hope that, that, that you look at me and you say, hey, Steve's a great person. Brother Mike's a great person. You're great people. But I'm going to tell you, nothing compares to the greatness of the person of Jesus Christ. My brothers and I, and it's already time for me to stop. My brothers and I used to sing a song. <laughs> we used to sing lots of songs, but... This song says, while one night upon the sea, a ship was tossing to and fro. 
Breakers dashed on every hand as angry winds around did blow. All on board were filled with fright as the mighty billows rolled. Then they called upon the one who the winds and waves controlled. Though the storms of life may rage and the billows round you roll, he can calm life's troubled sea as he did in days of old. As upon life's sea you sail, trust in him who never fails. I'm so glad he sails with me because he's the master of the sea.